And my name is Julie Pireto. I'm, I'm teaching biochemistry and metabolism at the University of Valencia. And since many years, I became interested in the origin and evolution of metabolism. So I will speak a little bit about that. Uh, here you have uh, my address. Uh, you need in the future to contact me. And uh, also my recent, my very recent uh, new affiliation, the Institute for Integrative Systems Biology. This is a very new institute launched just one month ago in my university after eight years of preparing and, and talking and discussing about that. We have a new building, we have a new uh, group of teams coming from computational science, uh, theoretical physics, biochemistry, genetics, and many different disciplines together to, uh, with a focus uh, uh, in microbiology and applied microbiology. So systems and synthetic biology will be one of the focus of, of this new institute. Uh, also, I'm very happy to, to say that uh, for the first time, Yesterday, the University of Valencia will have a woman as a president. So this is also very good news for us, and I want to share with you. As Herves told you, uh, we will uh, speak a little bit about the transition from geochemistry to biochemistry long time ago in this planet. Uh, this is a very vast problem. There is a huge amount of theories, models, simulations, experiments. And I have to choose. I, mean, I cannot, in three hours, I have two talks to this morning. Um, I, don't, I don't have enough time to, to explain you everything. So I will put in on almost every, every slide a reference uh, where the figure was taken or, or whatever. Of course, uh, I will be here until Friday morning. So. After the discussion today, if you want to speak a little bit more about anything, any topic, any aspect that that, that has been uh, exposed here or that has was uh, left behind because uh, because of, of lack of time, so um, I will just uh, introduce the topic in a historical uh, way, uh, at least the, the the characteristics of the problem that we want to uh, treat today. Then I will speak a little bit of, about ingredients, that means uh, prebiotic chemistry, also the forces behind the origin of life, and the efforts uh, to experimentally build a protocell. And then the second part of, of, of in, the, in the second talk, I will focus on the origins of metabolism. I choose that one because usually this is not uh, treated in the in the in the general reviews or textbooks. This uh, is a topic that is is uh, hardly uh, um, um, addressed. So I will devote the second part uh, to to metabolism. So to start, Darwin. Why Darwin? We know Darwin because uh, he was. Uh, famous author of the natural selection theory and other theories, uh, several theories about the evolution of life. And you cannot find in the books or papers he published anything about origins of life, in the sense that he was talking about the evolution of species, how a species is emerged from other ones, but uh, not the origin of the first one. Although he had uh, some good ideas, a few hints in the, in the published work, but also very nice things in the unpublished work. We are very fortunate that we keep, in the, especially in the, the collection of the University of Cambridge, many papers, letters, uh, notebooks of Darwin, and we, the historians can just uh, look at that uh, manuscripts and well, we have a nice idea about this apparently silent uh, attitude about the origins of life. First of all, in the book, The Origins of Life, there is uh, many uh, times he refers to this metaphor of the tree of life. It was a kind of 
a way to represent the relationship between all the species on Earth. This is a kind of bifurcation. This is the principle of divergence. So he was playing with the idea many years before the origins of a species. The origins of a species was published in 1859. But in the notebooks of 1837, we find already these kind of drawings uh, trying to visualize the relationship between a species. Now we are able to read the history of the species in the macromolecules, uh, proteins and genes. And that was proposed in the 60s by several people, including or especially Emil Zuckerkandel and Linus Pauling. And they were proposing that if you can learn to read the evolutionary history in macromolecules, you will be able to reconstruct the historical relationships between all species, big and small, without, with bones or without bones, animals and plants, microorganisms, whatever. So this could be kind of the dream of Darwin, to have the universal tree of life. So we have uh, methods to reconstruct the history of life from proteins. One of the first to be used was cytochrome C, that is a respiratory protein that is uh, present in many different organisms. But then in the 70s, people like Carl Woss and George Fox used the ribosome, the, particularly the ribonucleic part of the, of the, of the small subunit of the, of the ribosome to reconstruct this universal uh, tree of life. This is one of the latest versions of this universal tree of life. You, you can see here the relationship between uh, bacteria, that is all this part of the tree, archaea, this part of the tree, and eukaryotes. Okay? And the red po uh, spot, red dots, means uh, microorganisms that we have n nothing else than genomes, but not uh, isolated uh, microorganisms. So with modern techniques of metagenomics, we can uh, explore biosphere in a, in, in a way that Darwin was unable to imagine. But the imagination of Darwin was able to predict that everything on Earth, every living thing on Earth, have a common origin. So that was a conjecture in, uh, that was exposed in the, in, the, in the book, The Origins of Species. And I always am amazed because he was uh, using a very small amount of information in comparison to all the genetic, biochemical, and molecular evidences that we have today to conclude that everything on Earth have a common origin. So this common origin that we call the last common ancestor, the last universal common ancestor, Luca, Sen ancestor, there are several different terms referring to this point that is the first bifurcation in the di diversification of life from bacteria to the other things. This is the most accepted uh, topology of the universal tree. But I will insist uh, several times there is a difference in complexity, at least in complexity. We don't know how, how long it took from the origins of life to Luca, but of course, there is, is not the same. I mean, this is very, and a very important idea they have to, to keep in mind, that in the scientific uh, literature, there are many examples of people confusing Luca and the characteristics of Luca we can deduce from the comparison of all, all the biodiversity with the origins of life. So I will insist with that. Following Darwin also, we, today we have many evidences of the history, um, the record of the history of life uh, on, on the planet. So he was completely uh, shocked by the absence of fossils before the Cambrian, before the in strata uh, older than 500 million years. And he was, well, sometimes Darwin was answering in a way that is a little bit surprising, saying that, for example, to the question why we do not find records of this vast primordial period, I can give no satisfactory answer. That's it, point. Dot. And, uh, but now we have this 
continuous re uh, record of uh, 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 life remnants until uh, the beginning of Archean. So in other talks in this course, we will, you will have uh, information about these very old remnants in form of chemical, uh, isotopic, uh, microfossils or stromatolites that's, that are indicating that life started very early in the history of our planet. So at least before 3.5 uh, billion years ago. But what about how life emerged? Uh, for Darwin, this was, that was a very uh, difficult problem that was unable to, to, to deal with uh, publicly in the books or papers. But he was very explicit in the, uh, a letter to a, to a friend, uh, Joseph Hooker, the botanist. And we were, with together several colleagues, uh, we were um, uh, in 2009, it was the, the bicentennial of, of, of Darwin. We were publishing this, this uh, short uh, paper in Origins of Life and Evolution of Biosphere, that is the official journal of the International Society for the Study of Origins of Life trying to reconstruct the, the Darwin's thinking about uh, origins of life. And this letter that was already known, but uh, now is very famous, uh, is one of the more explicit uh, uh, explanations on the origins of life by Darwin. Um, this was published, uh, a short uh, fragment of this letter, many years after Darwin's death. And we don't have evidences that the main authors talking about origins of life at the beginning of the 20th century were aware of this idea. But look at the sentence. He is uh, proposing a warm little pond, I mean water, liquid water with not so cold, uh, different chemicals, in particular ammonia and phosphoric salts. So he was aware of the importance of nitrogen and phosphorus for, for life. Light heat electricity, this means some source of energy in the primitive earth. And a protein compound chemically formed. Well, I'm not sure that for him protein me meant the same for that for us, because proteins were chemicals that were identified or at least uh, very um, described in detail many years after uh, this letter, in particular in the, at the beginning of 20th century. So maybe he's meaning a very primor primordial uh, compound, primitive compound, chemically formed from simple molecules, but that is the, for me, the core sentence at the end, ready to undergo a still more complex changes. He's proposing a molecule evol evolving, a molecule with the ability to evolve. That is a very modern uh, thinking, uh, if, you, if you put it in context of uh, this, this idea. Particularly, scientists were putting together many different uh, informations from many different disciplines that try to, to explain the scenario of, of the origins of life many years after this sentence. In particular, uh, uh, Operin in, in Russia, in the Soviet Union, uh, uh, was a biochemist, and also John Haldane, that is a very important British scientist. That was without knowing each other, and independently, they were proposing mechanisms for the origin of life with two important uh, ideas. That is a chemical problem, how the transition of more or less complex mixture of molecules to the very primitive cells is a chemical problem, but very important in an evolutionary context. So they were trying to explain this in the context of a cosmic evolution, uh, planet evolution, and of course, chemical evolution and then biochem biochemical and biological evolution. So 
those are characteristics uh, that are common to these two uh, uh, proposals. Of course, for a pairing, Haldane was one of the he made important contributions to uh, population genetics and evolutionary theory. And Oparin had a very direct gene genealogy with uh, the evolutionary theory through his teacher, uh, Timiri Asep, that he was a plant physiologist that was traveling to London to meet, to meet Darwin personally. And he was the introductor of Darwinism in, uh, in, in Russia. So Oparin was... Uh, a student of Timir Yasef, and he was learning uh, uh, about Darwin and his theory very directly from, from Timir Yasef. So let's talk a little bit about ingredients in this transition from geochemistry to biochemistry. First of all, water. I will not explain too much about water because in other, in other talks, maybe the, using the same slide, People is emphasizing that water is present in the solar system, even in other bodies of the polar system in much, in much proportion than on Earth. But we all agree that life as we know, uh, as we know it, needs liquid water. Then also uh, in the history of our, of our solar system, there were other bodies like Mars that maybe they were plenty of, of water and today is not is not the case organics uh, chemicals based on carbon there are many uh, examples and Hervé will talk about this uh, tomorrow um, of uh, uh, molecules based on carbon that are present in the interstellar space in comets and asteroids and we have a direct evidence, observation and direct evidence of the presence of this uh, chemistry. And the idea is, basically the conclusion is that our universe is essentially organic. I mean, the kind of chemistry of our universe is the chemistry of carbon. So it has not, nothing special to, to, to observe that life is a extrapolation of this uh, chemistry. So if you compare the kind of chemicals, organic, organic chemicals that are present, for example, in a meteorite, this is one of the Murchison meteorite. Murchison meteorite is one of the probably one of the fragments or, of matter more analyzed in the history. So there are many compounds, many families of compounds, millions of uh, examples of different molecules belonging to amino acids, uh, sugars, uh, nitrogen bases, uh, aliphatic molecules, uh, apolar, whatever. Then if you compare with cells, there are several families of complex molecules, proteins. We don't find any protein in, uh, uh, in, in meteorites. Complex lipids made out of fatty acids. We find some uh, fatty acids and um, similar molecules in, 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 in meteorites. Nucleic acids, we don't find nucleic acids in, in meteorites, but we find sugars or nitrogen bases. Polysaccharides are present also in cells. We have the, the monomers, the sugars, but not the polymers. So in cells we have a small repertoire of um, mm, small molecules, monomers, and a big diversity of complex molecules like proteins, um, membrane lipids, uh, nucleic acids, and polysaccharides. So one thing we can say that life is based in a, a small subset of the all possible chemicals. In this uh, graph taken from this uh, paper by, by Jim Cliffs, he is comparing the amount of isomers, excluding stereoisomers, only structural isomers of, of, uh, in, function, uh, in, in terms of number of carbons, and then the amount or the proportion of this uh, uh, variety of, uh, in, in this case is for amino acids, that are used or present in, in cells, in biology. So if you increase the complexity and also the, the variety of molecules that are possible, 
life is using a very small proportion of these. For example, 20, the 20 proteic amino acids, proteigenic amino acids, are a small subset of all the possible amino acids that are, many of them are present in meteorites. So finally, we can say that we find in our university a huge diversity of chemicals with modest complexity. And then in, in biology, we, we find a small, small uh, uh, diversity of molecules, but the combination of those molecules generating a huge uh, complexity. So maybe forces like natural selection, but also historical contingency are responsible of this uh, selection, or maybe there were uh, chemical uh, chemical forces, determinisms uh, to to com to configure this small set of of molecules uh, in biology. So this is one of the questions that I think this I think in my opinion is very interesting to to address. We, we don't have a clear uh, uh, answer, but uh, hopefully after giving you some hints of uh, uh, prebiotic chemistry, we can at least in a provisional way to give uh, an answer. So as said before, uh, there are many models, hypotheses, theories, or proposals about origins of life. There are these extraterrestrial origins of panspermia. I, I, I don't want to, to talk about that. I mean, if, you, if anybody is interested in the historical aspects of this idea that was proposed in the 19th century, uh, I will be delighted to discuss afterwards. But now I will, I will focus on the origin on Earth uh, based on organic chemistry, either from uh, pre, pre uh, formed or pre-existence of this organic uh, chemistry before the emergence of life, or some, sometimes people is proposing that there were important processes of fixing carbon uh, in a primitive way, especially this kind of chemosynthetic uh, associated with uh, uh, red, uh, inorganic chemistry reactions of, of redox or reactions of inorganic chemistry, and also the, the existence of these two uh, important sources of organics in, on Earth, the exogenous delivery by comets, asteroids, or whatever, and uh, endogenous synthesis on Earth, atmospheric, volcanic, and so on. So this part of the heterotrophic uh, proposals were started by, as said before, by Oparin and Haldane in a very independent, uh, two independent proposals. There are some parallelism in, in, this, in these proposals. Uh, first is the consideration that on Earth, on the primitive Earth, there were many processes of uh, prebiotic synthesis of organics, and that compounds were the, both the ingredients for the first primitive cells, but also the food of those cells. So for them was more or less evident that uh, heterotrophic metabolism, metabolism based on pre-existent uh, organic matter, was the most primitive way uh, of, uh, of uh, metabolism. Of course, in an aero fermentation or heterotrophic fermentation would be uh, one of, of the models, because on Earth there, were, uh, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. And also, I put it here that in 1929, Haldane was taking the recent discovery of bacteriophage as a model of missing, a missing link between chemistry and biology. 20 or 30 years after this, uh, Haldane was saying that probably viruses were not playing a, an important role in the, in, the, in the origins of life, and who was claiming that kind of primitive, very primitive cell would be the first, uh, the first organisms on Earth. But one thing that has in common, uh, had, uh, both, both proposals have in common, is uh, the end of the speculation, the wild speculation, 
and the, the beginning of the scientific discussion and the proposal of a specific experimental uh, simulations. So up to that moment, people was able to well discuss, propose, and speculate about the origins of life without caring about the plausibility, chemical plausibility of these proposals. But those two people were, in one thing, were converging very well. That the idea that if you don't, if you are not able to contrast with an experiment, your proposal has no value. So the idea is, well, there are several, for example, stages or steps in this proposed mechanism by Oparin that was very well uh, specified in a book uh, in, the, in 1936, translated into English in 38, that is the, the one in the slide. And for example, if you are proposing that from an anoxic reducing atmosphere, there will be organic synthesis, synthesis and accumulation of organics from more or less simple molecules, you have to test that and give evidences that that is possible, chemically possible. So that was the beginning of this experimental simulation, it's the opening the door of the laboratory of chemistry to test all these things. Of course, organic synthesis was very well known. Organic synthesis was born in 19th century, in Germany especially, and related to uh, industrial problems. And there are many examples of uh, publications and descriptions of synthesis of, of course, the famous uh, synthesis of urea, but also synthesis of amino acids, sugars, whatever. But none of those were in the context of uh, testing the plausibility of an uh, origins of life hypothesis. They were related to uh, industrial problems or were related in, at, at best with the problem of carbon fixation in plants. They were trying to model this process. After opening and holding proposals in the 20s, there were people trying to simulate those proposals in the laboratory. So this is the beginning of prebiotic chemistry. So there's se organic synthesis in the context of a model or of hypothesis on the origins of life. So historically, the first to try to model or to simulate uh, one of these ideas was Stanley Miller in the University of Chicago, working with uh, under the supervision of uh, Harold Urey. Harold Urey was a chemist, very famous, with a Nobel Prize, that was uh, uh, author of many papers and books about atmosf uh, planetary atmosf atmospheres. And he was thinking that the primitive uh, Earth was uh, had an, an atmosphere rich in reduced uh, gases like molecular hydrogen, ammonia, methane, and water, of course. So he was, he had this idea, and Miller, as a student of him, was trying to test that the, pos the possibility of going from this reduced atmosphere to organics. And he designed this uh, now nowadays very famous uh, apparatus, uh, glass apparatus, with this uh, flask uh, with electrodes simulating the atmosphere and the electric discharges as an um, energy source. And with this, uh, in the series of these four pictures, it's evident that something is happening during the first hours and the first days after the start the experiment. He was using a very simple uh, technique to identify some of the compounds, this is uh, chroma paper chromatography that maybe even today, uh, the students are not uh, uh, doing any more, even in the in the first year. And um, well, it was a very nice demonstration that uh, very simple molecules like ammonia or methane 
were giving rise to molecules like alanine or glycine. So there was a, immediately there was the, they were aware that there was a problem since uh, in front of Ure there were other planetologists that were saying that maybe the atmosphere was not so reducing. So in this graph uh, it's shown how the yield of uh, organic synthesis is changing when you change the redu redox uh, status of the, of the gases. And if you reduce the amount of hydrogen or if you go to atmospheres like uh, CO2 instead of uh, methane, the yields are, are very low. And that was one of the problems that for many years many people were uh, uh, mm, proposing that maybe the experiment of, of, of Stanley Miller was not representative of the, of the uh, processes in the atm primitive atmosphere. This uh, paper, this one in two, 2008, that was the very last paper by Miller, that they were using CO2 as a main carbon source in the experiment, but then taking several differences with the original experiment, like buffering the pH, that in the original uh, paper there were not uh, buffer, and also preventing the oxidation of the products. So they, they, they demonstrated that even with CO2 we can, we can get good yields of, of amino acids. In any case, Miller was trying different apparatus, different uh, devices. For example, this one that was uh, published after Miller's uh, death. They were, they were finding, the students were finding the um, the collaborators were finding uh, many samples uh, in the laboratory from all the experiments that they, they reanalyzed and published the, the results. For example, in this case, this uh, new configuration of the, of, the, of the apparatus trying to simulate what is happening in many volcanic uh, uh, eruptions, that these electric discharges uh, in, the, in the gases of the, of the volcanic gases. And they find, of course, the result is that there are many, uh, in this case, amino acids uh, produced under these conditions. But Mal Miller was not alone. Many people were trying to introduce the idea of simulating in the laboratory the synthesis of important biomolecules. One of those historical experiments was the synthesis by John Oro in 1961 of adenine from uh, hydrogen cyanide. Uh, this is a very simple reaction. If you count the, num the, the, element, the elements in adenine, you have five carbons, five hydrogens, five nitrogens. So adenine is a pentamer of hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide is very abundant in the universe and also is produced in, in, in Miller's experiment. So it's plausible that adenine was uh, synthesized uh, uh, in the primitive atmosphere or in the parental bodies of, of meteorites and many other places in the universe can have the conditions to, to give this uh, molecule that is now present in, in every single uh, uh, living being. But also people were trying to uh, understand the origin of sugars. This is the foremost reactions. That is a polymerization, a catalytic pro polymerization of uh, formaldehyde. And with foremost reaction, we have the problem that uh, there are mm, thousands of uh, possible compounds, uh, sugars of different lengths, uh, even uh, straight uh, skeletons or branched. Uh, uh, the, the mixture of isomers uh, and stereoisomers. In this chromatogram, there are two arrows uh, pointing to the D and L ribose. The ribose is a very important sugar for life <coughs> because it's the component of uh, uh, nucleic acid, uh, RNA. But then this is a minor product of uh, foremost reaction. Many people were trying to modify the conditions, uh, trying, uh, looking for uh, mineral catalysis or other modifications of the foremost reactions. 
to have uh, the opportunity to increase the yield of ribose, and it's not clear how ribose was selected, if, if that occurred uh, once uh, on Earth, from those uh, very, very uh, complex mixture of molecules. So in a recent uh, review, Heislam and Pauner have proposed that in, in classic prebiotic chemistry there are three main pillars. The one uh, represented by the polymerization of hydrogen cyanide, the one represented for the polymerization of formaldehyde, the formose reaction, and the combination of hydrogen cyanide and aldehydes, that is the Schrecker mechanism that is observed in the Miller experiment. There are several problems with these three pillars. First of all, there is an intrinsic incompatibility of the <coughs> hydrogen cyanide chemistry and formaldehyde or aldehydes chemistry. And also there is a problem in the sense that those are reactions that are going on, going on on time, giving rise to complex mixtures. Among those complex mixtures, there are the interesting compounds, adenine or uh, amino, some amino acids or some sugars, but then many other things. I mean, the question is how life started from a very complex um, uh, mixture of molecules. Even worse, if you suppose that any mechanism was uh, able to select some of those compounds, intermediate compounds, like adenine and ribose, for example. Then the combination of adenine and ribose is probably one of the reactions that was um, more important for prebiotic chemistry during the 20th century, but nobody was able to give us a plausible mechanism to you to, to link the adenine with ribose to generate, for example, adenosine that is in, on, en route of uh, becoming a monomer of uh, ribonucleic uh, acids. So this reaction is a nightmare for the prebiotic chemist that was for many years, for many decades, people were trying to reproduce in the laboratory this kind of reaction. We know that some enzymes uh, are able to do something like that, but without enzymes uh, in a plausible prebiotic setting, this is not uh, possible. Well, very recently, John Sutherland uh, in United Kingdom, now in Cambridge, was proposing the cyanosulfidic proto-metabolism mm -hmm. scenario. He was trying a kind of chemistry based on hydrogen cyanide, uh, hydrogen sulfide, some ions, phosph uh, phosphate, and more importantly, uh, UV light as an ingredient. And out of these simple uh, molecules and compounds, it is generated a family of intermediates that at the end generate the precursors of several amino acids, but not many, not uh, uh, strange or present in meteorites, but the ones present in, the, in, in biology, but also nucleotides and saving the, this big problem of the union of uh, nucleobase and sugar that was impossible to find in classic prebiotic chemistry. This is a typical systems chemistry approach that people is trying now of uh, playing or working with complex mixtures, multi-component systems. Some of the components are participating as substrates or intermediates, but also as a cat cat uh, catalyzers. For example, in this scheme, phosphate is used as, as uh, substrate in this re last reaction to the nucleotide, and also in this uh, to glycerol phosphate, but in this reaction, or in this one, is participating as a, as a catalyzer. So, 
Uh, focusing on the nucleotide problem, I said that this is, was not observed. And Sutherland is uh, focusing the problem as an organic uh, chemist with a strong background in, in, in synthesis. And they are very well trained to decompose, deconstruct molecules to discover how to build the molecule in the best way. So he discovered that this reluctant bond that classic prebiotic chemistry was unable to find, this one, nucleobase and sugar, is already forming the first step of his reaction. So it's implicit in the mechanism. We learn biochemistry deconstructing molecules uh, in a way that is easy for our brain. We have a nucleotide and we decompose with sugar and the base. And we learn the bases, the sugars, and then just draw it together. Then a metabolism is not, not going that way. And probably in prebiotic chemistry, neither. So this is a different way to afford the problem. That is, the, that historically reluctant bond is formed here from the very beginning. And this is very, a very, very smooth way to a, a small repertoire of molecules, not a big diversity. Then we will try to explain, uh, like people like Hervé will try to explain uh, the diversity we observe in meteorites or comets. That is a different problem. We're trying to understand how life started, probably not from a huge diversity of molecules, but maybe from a small subset of molecules that was determined by a special kind of chemistry. A student of Sutherland, uh, Matt Pauner, now in the in UCL, was able to demonstrate very recently that for the first time we can have a scheme of reactions that simultaneously give uh, purines and pyrimidine uh, nucleotides. Uh, in the Sutherland scheme there were only as a product the uh, pyrimidine uh, nucleotides, but then Pauner has offered, has published recently uh, the simultaneous synthesis of these four: cytosine, uracil, adenine, and hypoxanthine, that is the precursor of uh, uh, guanine. So, not many different nucleobases, not many different. Uh, no, not a huge diversity of nucleobases, only four. Two pyrimidines and two purines. Let's talk a little bit about forces. So from systems chemistry is emerging the image of that probably on, on the primitive earth there, were chem there was a chemical determinism that was focusing on a small set of molecules given rise to the uh, complexity of life. So we could have this first part of uh, proto-metabolism that for some authors is equivalent to prebiotic chemistry. So all Sutherland is using proto-metabolism taken from, from the dupe. I will explain a little bit about that in, in the second part. But Proto-metabolism means uh, metabolism, um, a primitive metabolism before life. So this is a kind of prebiotic chemistry, or systems chemistry also is called, with the emergence of monomers, oligomers. Well, how monomers became oligomers or uh, short polymers? There are many uh, examples of good candidates to of. Uh, molecules promoting the uh, synthesis of short uh, polymers. We are not talking about here proteins, genetically co coded proteins or something like that. We are talking about very primitive uh, combination 
of uh, combinations of uh, nucleotides or amino acids to give rise to short um, uh, polymers. So, of course, there will be self-assembly. We will talk a little bit afterwards uh, about self-assembly. For example, of uh, apolar or hydrophobic molecules in water self-assemble in uh, complex uh, structures like uh, liposomes or vesicles. The non-enzymatic polymerization, of course, this uh, formation of vesicles, all this part would be uh, under the force of a chemical determinism. The, the, the conditions, the environmental conditions, uh, would determine uh, this, uh, the kind of molecules and also the kind of reactions that were possible. Before ending in this first stage of the RNA peptide world. I will explain in some slides what that means. The beginning of or the starting of natural selection of one of the strands in this uh, process. So before the emergence of RNA there were only physical physics and chemistry but then after natural selection emerged there are very efficient and strong uh, force uh, behind the process of evolution, that is the possibility to optimize, for example, uh, catalysts, catalysts. So natural selection, again, a little bit of history. The first to propose was Charles Darwin, but also uh, Alfred Wallace, they were co-authors of this idea, although Darwin had the idea 20 years before. And this is very well documented. You can you can check uh, in the history uh, of biology that uh, the idea that is very nice and apparently very simple of uh, natural selection that was written for the first time in a notebook in 1838 with this very short uh, summary by Darwin after reading Malthus. So he was reading the essay of uh, uh, principle of population of Malthus that was trying to understand how pop human population grows uh, uh, faster than the, the resources. And he was just taking this very short um, idea about uh, genetic transmission of, of characteristics, diversity, Nobody is identical to any other uh, uh, individual. Uh, and great fertility in proportion to resources. So those are the uh, strength uh, uh, ideas about uh, natural selection. And at the molecular level, we can also ask about this uh, how to apply this uh, idea of natural selection. So, anything that is able to reproduce with imperfections would be the object of natural selection. And RNA, for example, that we know that can be reproduced, replicated. There are viruses that use RNA as a genome. But also, there are many examples of RNA uh, reproduced in the laboratory. I mean, the processes of artificial selection, artificial evolution in the laboratory, all the techniques of Selex and other techniques that are, are demonstrating the possibility to evolve populations of RNA in the laboratory. So anything that is able to reproduce with imperfections and after uh, replication, Replica not, nothing is perfect and replication neither. I mean, replication is always with uh, mistakes, always with uh, imperfections. So automatically we have this uh, property of natural selection uh, uh, active. So in the 60s, last century, there were many people uh, asking about how things started uh, on Earth since 
after molecular biology was defining the relationships between the key players of the information um, transmission in cells, they were very, very difficult uh, to understand uh, or to explain how it started the system. We know that, well, in 1958, Francis Crick, the one co-author of the double helix, helix, was proposing this scheme that is still valid completely, that is the, the so-called central dogma of molecular biology. If you look at this uh, drawing, the only player that has no uh, an arrow starting from, from it is protein. All the arrows are pointing to protein, but there is no arrows starting from protein to any other of the players. This is the central dogma. Information is always flowing from nucleic acids to proteins never the other way around. That's it. Of course, the textbooks will explain the central dogma in other ways. Or, for example, that reverse transcriptase was the discovery of an enzyme able to go from RNA and DNA, and this is violation of the central dogma. It's not true, because it's a flux from um, between nucleic acids, and uh, that was already drawn in the original scheme of Crick this arrow well before the discovery of reverse transcriptase. So you have this, and, and this represents theoretical flow, flow of information, and this also theoretical flow of information, and experimentally can be demonstrated that DNA also has the possibility to uh, in vitro, not in cells, as far as we know, uh, can operate as a template for protein synthesis. So. This is the central dogma. This is the relationships between the key players today. DNA is able to replicate. Uh, DN information in DNA is flowing from DNA to RNA in transcription and from RNA to protein in translation. Protein is catalyzing most of reactions in metabolism, but also is important or necessary for translation. We need proteins for translation, for example, the the only elements in the cell that know the genetic code are amino acid tRNA synthases. There are 20 enzymes that are able to recognize a tRNA and amino acid and making a covalent bond among them. Those are the only elements that know the genetic code, how to uh, correlate tRNA with amino acid. Not the ribosome, but the amino acid tRNA synthesis. But then you need also proteins for transcription, of course, polymerases and other enzymes. And proteins for replication. DNA alone cannot replicate. Need proteins, polymerases, helicases, and a huge variety of proteins. So if everything depends on everything, because for proteins I need the information in DNA, but for flowing the, the flow of information in proteins, how all the thing started at the beginning. That was a kind of chicken and egg problem. And several thinkers, Alexander Rich in the first time, Carl Walsh, Francis Crick, Leslie Orgel, independently, they were discussing theoretically about this problem. And all of them were converging with the idea that probably everything started with RNA. That was a, a speculation that RNA would be able to store information was known, because there are many viruses that use RNA as a genome. That RNA can give rise to proteins is one of the processes that, uh, uh, sorry, that RNA is able to catalyze his own synthesis or metabolic reaction was unknown. That was a part of speculation. But if RNA would be able to do that, then we could 
start with this scheme. This scheme was proposed in 1986 by Walter Gilbert and labeled as the RNA world hypothesis after the discovery of the catalytic ability of RNA, the existence of ribozymes. That means that this idea that was just conceptual in the 60s, 20 years after that, there were evidences that RNA was able to catalyze reactions. So the RNA world was very nice from the molecular biology point of view, but then it started the prebiotic chemistry nightmare because to explain the origin of RNA from a prebiotic point perspective was very, very difficult. One additional observation that was very nice in the context of the RNA, there are many things that could be explained about the RNA world and many circumstantial uh, observations. But this one, I like very much this one, when was demonstrated that the synthesis of proteins in extant cells, in contemporary cells, the synthesis of proteins is catalyzed by RNA. RNA make proteins in our cells. Not proteins make proteins. So the activity of generating the peptide bond during the protein synthesis in the ribosome is catalyzed by the RNA. The RNA uh, making the larger subunit, uh, subunit of the R R ribosome. So that were, there were many uh, more or less circumstantial observations or evidences that uh, that was the case. Then there was the demonstration that RNA was able to perform this chemistry in an in vitro uh, um, demonstration with uh, artificial evolved RNA in the laboratory. And finally, in 2000, we had the direct visualization of that, that peptidyl transferase, this uh, uh, catalytic center in the ribosome, is RNA. We humans are very visual animals, so we see, now we can see directly that the place where the reaction take place, this uh, peptidyl transferase center, is devoted to proteins. Proteins are in blue, and this part is only RNA. So, RNA is able to synthesize proteins, and this is one of the strongest uh, observations in favor of this RNA world. <coughs> so, of course, we can uh, uh, discuss why RNA inventing proteins, if you uh, accept this expression, was the, the beginning of the end of the RNA world, because protein, proteins were substituting RNA in many, most uh, metabolic uh, performances. Also, RNA was substituted by DNA uh, in the information uh, uh, um, function, storage and transmission from generation to generation. And there is a nice discussion about the qualities of uh, nucleic acids and proteins to perform the functions. And of course, RNA world has a big limitation that you cannot see a very good polymer for information storage and at the same time, a very good polymer for catalysis. For the first thing, you need to be linear to act as a template then if you complicate things uh, making three-dimensional uh, uh, structures, it would be very difficult to obtain this template. But then if you want to be a cat catalyst, you have to have three-dimensional form. I mean, the complementary of the transition state of a reaction. So those are different properties that are playing in a kind of you know, trade-off that is uh, claiming for a division of labor. And the great invention in evolution was to separate 
in two different polymers these two big or important uh, functions, informa information storage and catalysis, nucleic acids and proteins. So this is the last part of my first uh, talk, this building a protocell. I will go a little bit farther in complexity. We can deconstruct uh, cells in three main subsystems. You know, there is a famous uh, uh, chef in Spain, Ferran Adrià, that was deconstructing Spanish omelette and offering in his famous restaurant the Spanish deconstructed Spanish omelette. So if this is possible, we can deconstruct a cell for sure. So in cells, we recognize three main subsystems. The one related to membranes, that is the one related to the self-reproducing uh, reproductive uh, um, aspect or properties of the cells related to vesicles and the generation of uh, new vesicles out of new uh, amphiphilic molecules incorporated uh, to the system. This is an autocatalytic process from vesicles we generate more vesicles. Self-replication self -replication of uh, informative uh, information related templates, genetic templates. From one template we generate more templates. This is very also very well known. And the third one that is not too much appreciated but is also very important is the ability to self-construct from some components to generate more components. I mean the, of everything. Just think about a bacterial culture like E. coli that is very common in the laboratory that in the optimal on the under optimal conditions you you duplicate the population in 20 minutes. That means in 20 minutes you need twice proteins, lipids and everything that is constituent of a cell. You need an autocatalytic mechanism to generate everything twice. So this is represented by this scheme and the common property of those uh, subsystems is autocatalysis. Autocatalysis is uh, represented here by the mechanism of generating more of the thing that you are consuming. You consume a vesicle to generate two vesicles, you consume a DNA molecule to generate two molecules, you consume ATP for example in glycolysis to generate more ATP in glycolysis. Okay? We have to explain how those subsystems emerge in, on, in, uh, or, uh, from, from primitive uh, processes like terrestrial or extraterrestrial ingredients, uh, cosmic volcanic or atmospheric chemistry, so there are many people trying to explain in separated uh, chapters or separated labs the emergence of RNA or something like RNA, pre-RNA world or whatever, the emergence of uh, primitive vesicles, the emergence also of uh, autocatalytic sets of uh, molecules representing these three subsystems uh, that I call this infrabiological, they're taking the term from San uh, Mari, infrabiological or suprachemical, that is saying the intermediate complexity from prebiotic chemistry and biochemistry. So boundary, proto-metabolism, template chemistry and the combination of those subsystems. There are many people trying to combine subsystems to learn about the, the behavior of those systems and to identify the emergence of new properties. It's not the same, the amphiphilic molecules, that the vesicles. Vesicles have new properties. It's not the same vesicles, empty vesicles, that vesicles with RNA inside and so on. 
So there, the idea is to combine the subsystems until this articulation of the three subsystems that would be, we, we can call it a protocell. And of course, there are many models of amphiphilic molecules. Here uh, I saw, maybe Hervé saw in also something similar, that is the presence of amphiphilic molecules in meteorites and the use of different prebiotic uh, uh, scenarios like uh, fischer tropsch synthesis for the emergence, abiotic uh, emergence of, uh, of amphiphilic molecules, like David Dimmer has demonstrated also, among others. The use of uh, um, simple models to study these vesicles. Then we have a kid, the picture of uh, Oparin, Opari because one was one of the the, the first scientists trying to mm, visualize and model these uh, compartments, primitive compartments. He was using these coacervates models that we are not uh, using anymore. Now is uh, many people working with vesicles, and particularly from fatty acid vesicles that have a collection of properties very interesting. I mentioned here the works by uh, Sostak and collaborate, collaborators with these vesicles. There are many properties interesting, and one of them is in this scheme. The, the, uh, the coupling of, of uh, osmotic forces inside the vesicle with the behavior the, the macroscopic behavior of ves vesicles. So we have an increase in the uh, osmotic stress of the vesicle. The vesicle is taking amphiphilic molecules from the medium, is growing, and up to critic uh, critical uh, surface volume uh, relationship, the vesicle spontaneously reproduces. So you can cap, uh, there is a coupling between replication inside, if you have, that has been demonstrated, for example, with PCR uh, mixtures inside of gi giant vesicles. You can couple replication inside with reproduction. And this is just f physics and chemistry. There is no biology behind. And maybe it's indicating that biological processes are built on fundamental physicochemical <laughs> properties of the system, of course. Well, but we have to discover those physicochemical fundamentals that most of them are still unknown. And of course, this is one of the main uh, uh, goal of uh, systems chemistry, to build these complex uh, uh, systems made out of vesicles inside uh, replicative molecules and also, um, if possible, uh, self-sustained uh, networks that people is trying to to do experiments with that. Of course, also there are computational simulations and people that is trying the computer uh, uh, computer simulations of these uh, systems. But I'm talking about chemistry and some examples of those combinations. There are many examples of combination of uh, many examples of combination of RNA, catalytic RNA encapsulated in, in vesicles. There are some examples, interesting examples of uh, the behavior of vesicles with small networks of reactions. And well, there are not many examples of the combination of metabolic networks or at least metabolic products like peptides. There are a very nice recent work by Irene Chien in current biology this month, Blanco et al., that is trying to understand the relationship between RNA and uh, short peptides emerged by combinatorial chemistry. And they find very interesting things about the selection of some amino acids in the interactions between RNA and peptides. So there are many challenges. 
the reproduction of an integrated system is still, uh, I think, uh, not very close uh, goal. But we can present those goals in different ways. For example, that part that is the having a cell with a complete synthetic uh, genome is something that technically is possible. Craig Bender was publishing several years ago the transplantation of a synthetic genome to, uh, to a bacterium, but that is plagiarism. They were just copying verbatim a, ge a natural genome. We are not able, still not able to invent or to, uh, from scratch, uh, a genome. So we, well, we, we, we can take a natural genome, introduce some changes, and then perform this genome in the context of a cell. We can imagine probably a very simple cell devoted to metabolism. If you provide the cell with everything the cell needs to, to maintain and reproduce, or you can try this model that is was probably the simplest model we can imagine of a, of a minimal cell of RNA performing everything. So RNA has been demonstrated able to catalyze a huge diversity of reactions, many more than the ones that we observe today in cells, thanks to these experimental evolution technologies of uh, exploring the the space of reactions that RNA is able to catalyze and is able to do almost everything proteins do. I mean, from a chemical point of view, RNA is able to perform almost everything. So it's plausible to propose that RNA was catalyzing metabolism uh, in, a, in, in a primitive cell. So this could be a big picture of uh, the situation. Uh, from abiotic chemistry to proto-metabolism to these three subsystems that combined will generate these, for example, ribocells, that combination of RNA catalysis with all the other, other interactions that could imagine, like, for example, the ability of the lipid vesicles to catalyze reactions that can be demonstrated also, uh, catalysis of the peptide bond formation by uh, vesicles. And in a historical, we could translate these experimental settings to a historical picture, just to give a context of this, uh, of this process. From prebiotic chemistry to these different stages of RNA world, protein, the incorporation of protein, the incorporation of DNA, to this last common ancestor of LUCA. Everything was taking, taking place before LUCA because all the properties we observed, DNA as ma genetic material, ribosome as the protein factory, main, as we'll explain in the second part, the main pathways are universal. So everything was in place uh, before LUCA. And this is the way we were, we were proceeding in this part. And in my second part, uh, I will go a little bit further with the consideration of uh, metabolic pathways, trying to compare with pathways present in LUCA. So this approach, top-down approach, has also limitations. And the big question is how to fill the gap between the two approaches. I will address this in the second part. Just to finish, in relation to this, chemical determinism versus uh, uh, chance in the origins of life. I just uh, recovered these uh, sentences by two great scientists, Jacques Monod, that is originally the sentence in French, but I used the English translation. Le hasard et la nécessité, uh, it was a very important book in the, in the 70s, with many debates uh, about the, the things he was proposing. And Monod was saying that, well, after seeing the, the, the molecular biology complexity, 
those arrangements between DNA, RNA, and protein, and all the regulatory circuits, and all the complexity in cells. What at the beginning was probably expecting that the molecular details will give us clues about the origin it was completely the reverse. Was the problem was still more complicated for him. And he, if you look, if you read carefully the book, you will you will see that he is accepting that prebiotic chemistry will deliver polymers. But the problem for him would be, for example, the genetic code. How the this uh, relationship between nucleic acids and proteins was established, and for him was ki a kind of frozen accident was a matter of chance, of a very, very unlikely uh, success. So, that this famous sentence, the universe was not pregnant with life, nor the biosphere with man, is a kind of a very short, like in, was that, that was before Twitter, but it's a very nice sentence for Twitter. Um, the, he realized that probably life was a chemical miracle. And that was the thinking of a very close friend of him, Francis Crick, that he was also uh, very uh, I mean, very surprised by the molecular complexity of cells and had no explanation for this, uh, the origin of this uh, very complex relationship between nucleic acids and proteins. And in 1981, that was one year before ribozyme discovery, he was publishing this nice book, Life Itself, and he was saying the same. Probably, and, and look at these sentences and these attitudes, philosophically, are equivalent to creationism, in the sense that you are accepting that never will be possible to explain the natural origin of those things because you cannot explain a chance event by in scientific terms. And this is in the antipodes of many other scientists, and particularly people working in origins of life are in the antipodes of this thinking because all the people is accepting that we will discover the ways chemistry gave rise, to, geochemistry gave rise to biochemistry. And that means that mm, you are accepting more or less explicitly that there were, there were a chemical determinism in the origins of life. And that was strongly defended by Christian de Dieuk, Nobel Prize uh, in, in, cell, in, in medicine for the discovery of lysosomes and peroxisomes, and in a book, in several books, but this one is very nice also, Singularities, he is trying to defend this idea of uh, uh, chemical cosmic determinism. So there are pathways that are, are leading to small sets of molecules and uh, complex structures like uh, cells. And the champion of the cont historical contingency, that was Stephen Jay Gould, probably you or, already heard or, or, or read some of the books, this paleontologist was saying that everything interesting in the history of life was the result of historical contingency. But origins of life on Earth was virtually inevitable given the chemical composition of early oceans and atmospheres and the physical principles of self-organizing systems. So he was defending the inevitability of the origins of life on Earth. So, this is the end of the first part. Thank you.